Meeple Nation Podcast, episode 398, Four Economic Games. Welcome, citizens of Meeple Nation. For the next 30 minutes, sit back and enjoy. Meeple Nation Podcast is sponsored by GameToppersLLC.com. Go to their website, check out their game toppers that will fit on top of most any table that you have in your house. From a card table, to a dining table, to even an ottoman. You can enhance every game that you play by using a game topper from GameToppersLLC.com. Get some drink holders to put on the side, because there's no food on the Watson. Unless you've had it for like three years, and then food's apparently allowed on the Watson. Well, the main question is, can you form it as a base for an empire? If you're playing a Star Wars game, yes. Oh, okay, because you said ottoman, so I just... I see. A lab. Oh, Wait, you can now have food on the Watson because you can convert it into a table. A regular table with covers for it. Convert your gaming table into a dining table. I thought about trying to talk my wife into that, saying, hey, we can just get this new dining table for our home. But, uh, yeah, she didn't go for a third Watson. Well, that's why you should have gone for Mycroft. Yeah. Should have gone for the Mycroft. <laughs> that was your bad. That was, because then you can expand it for those holiday meals. Except for they don't do leaves for the Minecraft, so... Not yet. They will. Coming soon to a Kickstarter near you. Welcome to Meeple Nation. We are the hosts. It is Logan Howard. It's so polite when you welcome us. I appreciate that. You're welcome. This yeah. is Andy Holiday. That's Nathan Howard? And over there, that's Dave Holiday. Thanks for that weird intro. <laughs> <laughs> welcome. Check out our website. Speaking of checking out our website... Check out our website, meeplenation.com. Lots of cool stuff. You can listen to past episodes, read blogs, look at cool pictures, read all our bios, and uh, check out those blogs and leave us a comment. Tell us what you think. Meeplenation.com. This week, we are (laughs) discussing four economic games. So if you're looking for a little bit of cachet, we will trade you this information. Just for a high five later on. Wow. There's a lot that I'll do for a high five. My game is The Game of Life, which actually kind of goes against a lot of the reasons why I don't call games economic games when we were talking about it last time, because there's not actually a lot of economic principles in it. But it actually is one of the board games that actually has a really long history in the hobby. It was originally produced in 1860 by Milton Bradley, and then it was re-released 100 years later in the 1960s. The version that I grew up with, that's the one that it's based off of with its new redesign. So the game of life, it's designed to take you through life to where you either choose to go to college or if you just choose a job, you're going to get to the work and the rest of the game much faster. Hopefully be able to make more money work. Land on spots on where you have negative consequences. Life event happens. You go into debt. Sometimes you find money. They heavily skew it that you should go to college because that's where you make lots of money in that game. It gives you access to those higher paying careers. Right. right. Growing up and knowing three games, this was my favorite. My family, we loved this game, with my siblings and I. So we got it for our kids a long time ago, and they've redone the game so that now instead of just having all the board elements, those decisions... There are cards involved, and so you land on a spot, and it tells you to draw a card, and that card tells you this is your career. I can believe that you guys played this a lot, because I remember playing the game of life, and you end up with so many kids that they fall out of the car. I'm pretty uh-huh. sure your siblings played this maybe too much. <laughs> Took that very much to heart, yes. Right, yeah. I remember playing and running out of space and either grabbing a second car or stacking the pegs on top. Now I see that Dave's family has taken that to heart as well. This game goes through life. I guess it tries to teach the importance of certain events, but I don't think it impacts a young child's mind. The first choice, going to college or just going into the workforce, then you stop, you get married, stop, you have kids, you have to buy life insurance, fire insurance. And then depending on which homes stop and buy throughout your actions are victory points at the end of the game, because that's the whole point is the victory points you have at the end of the game is based off of money, the stock certificates, the versions I played anyway. When you stop to buy a house, you're not have the option of all the houses dealt, then you have to decide how much money to spend to get more victory points at the end of the game. Lower amount that you purchase it at, and at the end of the game mature, it's worth more money. 
So it was kind of funny. You talked about this game being one that you grew up playing. I played Life. I don't think we ever owned the game of Life until I had kids. Growing up, we played Payday. A similar aspect. Just had a recent conversation where somebody was asking about games that I played as a kid, and Payday was one of those games that I remember playing with the family, with my mom, my dad, and my older brother. Life was not one that I played unless I went to a friend's house. I think it was interesting, too. Out of the board games that we owned at the time, it was one of the more exciting ones just because it had 3D pieces. Everybody yeah. loves that spin down. This, the certain terrain to where the track it goes up the mountain. Ooh, boy, we gotta put the board game together. The Game of Life, I actually find it an interesting game. It's very simple, obviously, because all you're doing is spinning and going to the end. It's not necessarily a race because there's not, like, super detriments in the game. It's geared to be very family-friendly. Like Monopoly, but not as many family feelings have been hurt playing it. Not a table flipper, just a more casual game. Yeah. What's nice about some of these classic games, like Monopoly Risk anyway, they make it a little... They have digital versions for purchase on your Switch, your Xbox, your computer. You can sit down and play it and have a board game-like experience with your kids where it's really easily accessible. You don't have the kids flipping over the table trying to get to a particular piece. You don't have the two-year-old running amok with the cars and the little pegs of children everywhere. It is kind of nice to see some of those digital versions of games. Dave and I play a lot of games on Board Game Arena, and there's apps out there that you can play on your phone, that you can play many of these classic games and several new games as well. But that is The Game of Life. It is still produced by Milton Bradley. I want to talk about one of my favorite economic games. It's an older game still one of my favorites, and that's Acquire. Acquire's been around since 1964. It has re-released 13 times, so released a total of 14 different times. Published by Avalon Hill, it is a game where each player strategically invests in businesses and tries to retain the majority of stock in each of those businesses, or as many as they can. And then as the businesses grow, as you're placing tiles on the board... They also start merging, giving majority stockholders of the acquired businesses sizable bonuses, which can then be used to reinvest into other businesses or trade those in for stocks in the company that the company that took your company over that you had majority stock in. Super fun game. It's played on a grid that's a 12 by 9 grid, and you're placing tiles on the grid. It has, I don't know if all the copies have this, my copy, it's the 1999 release has 3D pieces for the businesses. As when you start a new company, you place the tiles on there. When you place a group of tiles, if there's already a company that's been built, if you place a tile that connects those two groups of tiles, there's a merger, depending on the size. So if something's at least 11 tiles in size, it, it can't be absorbed. It can only merge with smaller companies. If two smaller companies or a smaller business attaches itself on the board to a larger company, it is absorbed by that larger company. When this happens, you get to look and see who has majority stock. You're going to get a bonus. Whoever has minority, so second place, is going to get a cash bonus. And then you get to choose what you want to do. You can sell your stocks for what they're worth in that smaller company, or you can choose to keep your stock in hopes that later in the game that company is going to be put on the board again and you'll already have stock in that company. Or you can choose to trade your stock in you can trade two stocks in for one stock of the company that just absorbed the smaller one. Which is a great way to get majority if you're vying for majority of these big companies because that's where you're going to earn a lot of cash at the end of the game. Eventually, it's going to fill up to where there's only one or two of these large companies and then the game will end. So if you can get majority in one of those larger businesses by trading stocks in, and you have to decide because cash is king in this game. And it's really easy to run out of money. And if you don't have money, you can't buy stock. When you start a company, you get a free stock, and then you have the option to buy three stocks of anything that's available. If you don't have cash, then you don't get to buy anything. Sometimes it's just a great idea to get the majority, trade in a small company, trade those stocks and get cash on hand, and have the buying power to be able to purchase and maybe push someone out of the majority in one of those businesses. Super fun game. The funny thing is, is when you talk about it, it sounds so boring. But the gameplay, I love. It's a game I think that I could probably introduce to my dad, and I think he would like it. Well, if your dad likes stocks and bonds, I think he'd like Acquire just fine. Yeah, here's the thing. I own two copies of Acquire. If I took my copy with the big board and all the nice fancy tiles and 
I took that to his house and said, hey, you want to play this? I'll bet you anything he would say no. But I also have the original bookshelf version of this. And I think he would say yes. He probably would for that one. I think he would. That's what he has, of the old bookshelf version of Stocks and Bonds. Seeing that it's what it is, I'll bet you he would be interested in playing. Super fun game. I, If you haven't played Acquire, I highly recommend playing it. Because it has a two-player variant. And this one my wife and I will play. She loves playing this one with me. So I have a very fun story about Acquire. I haven't played Acquire for probably 15 years. The last time I remember playing was myself, Dave's oldest brother, Dennis, and Brent. We were playing the similar version where you had those plastic squares that you're putting there. Brent put down a tile that merged two companies, two rather large companies, so it made that it was over that 11 tiles, so it couldn't be taken over by anything else. However, he put his tile face down so that you couldn't confirm what that tile was. He did this just to antagonize Dennis. Dennis is very much just to make sure everything's straight, similar to Dave, but Brent had put this tile face down and just kind of left it there as, as bait for Dennis. A moment of silence while everybody watched to see if the tile was going <laughs> to remain there. And Dennis is like, are we just going to leave it there? <laughs> and uh, Brent's like, it's up to you. So we're just continuing on. The game lasts a little bit. We were probably another half hour into it, and this tile was still face down. You could just see Dennis just festering. Every time it was his turn, you just always see him looking at that tile. And then finally he just relented, and he had to flip it over. Burst of exasperation is, how are I going to flip that over? And mm-hmm. put it there. And Just wanted to make sure that it was the correct placement of that tile. Please uh, tell me it wasn't. No, it was. <laughs> Because that would have been epic if it was wrong. (laughs) That would have been epic, yes. But no, it was the correct tile. Dennis took it for as long as he could, like a champion, but gave in to anxieties and had to flip over that cube. I don't remember anything else about that game except for that. (laughs) No, I'm with you, though, Andy. This is a game that, I don't know when we discovered it, but same thing, right? My dad had the bookshelf version sitting on the shelf for I don't know how long being ignored at some point we pulled it off the shelf and started playing it i loved it i thought that was a great game that was the best of all of the ancient games that have been around forever so that's quite a great economic game the game i chose to talk about is xenon profiteer xenon profiteer is engine building game you're going to set up your console and your console has two sides on it you're going to put and on one side of that card, you're going to put contracts. And on the other side of the card, you're going to place upgrades. What you are trying to do is you're trying to fulfill contracts. And the first player to fulfill five of these contracts wins the game. To fulfill these contracts, these contracts require a certain amount of xenon gas. What you're going to do is throughout your turn, you're going to produce air packets. And these air packets will consist of four different gases. Nitrogen, oxygen, krypton, and xenon. On each turn, you are going to have the option to distill one of these gases from your hand. So you're going to be shedding these gases, and you have to shed these gases in order. So if you have nitrogen in your hand, you must shed that nitrogen. If you have no nitrogen, then you are allowed to shed your oxygen. And again, if you have no oxygen... You are allowed to shed that krypton, and then once xenon is the only gas left in your hand, you are able to isolate that xenon, and you are able to store it so that you can use that xenon to fulfill those contracts. In the middle of the table, there's two market rows, one for contracts and one that will be for upgrades. As you earn money, you can purchase these upgrades, and these upgrades will allow you to enhance or manipulate the amount of that you can distill, shed that gas from your hand to help you isolate that xenon better. Some of those cards will allow you to distill all the oxygen in your hand. During your regular distill action, distill and shed out that nitrogen. And then you will have that option to you can get rid of all that oxygen, or uh, you can find a way to get rid of krypton, be able to help augment and manipulate the cards that are in your hand. And then there's a couple other cards, the pipelines, that will allow you to increase your hand size, give you some points there. On your turn, you have a certain pattern that you've got to follow. First thing you're going to do is you're going to distill. And then you have the option to either 
pick up air packets, which is to pick up an air pack is a copy of the nitrogen, oxygen, krypton, and xenon, and add it to your discard pile. Or you can wipe one of the two market rows. And that will replace anything that's in the market row that isn't saved, replace those with new items, giving you the opportunity to purchase them or just get rid of a card that Dave wants so that he doesn't beat us. Rude. It's a true fact. Facts. <laughs> <laughs> the next thing you can do is you can buy. You can pick up a contract. They call it a buy, but you don't have to pay anything to take a contract. And you can have one active contract on your console at a time, or you can purchase an upgrade. You can't purchase both. You can either do the the, uh, the contracts or the upgrades. And so you can purchase that upgrade. It has two costs on it. It has a smaller cost to allow you to purchase that, and then it will go into your discard pile so you can use that card. Or you can pay a higher cost, and then you can actually just put that straight into play, and then you can just permanently add that to your console. If it goes into your discard pile, you can actually later, when you draw that card into your hand, you can either play it once and take the action, or you can pay the additional cost that it would take to permanently attach it to your console. The game will also end if you have five upgrades. Once one player has the five contracts or the five upgrades, the game ends, and then you're going to tally that score. Buying this option is an either-or, so you can either buy or you can bid. And by bid, you put a disc on one of those cards, either a contract or an upgrade, you're kind of putting a down payment on that card. If you buy that card later, you get a discount of one for each of your bid tokens that are on there. However, if another player has one of their bid tokens on that same card, you're going to have to pay them an additional money to take that card. If players are competing for the same card, they can throw those both there. They're taking away your discount. Or if there's a card that somebody else really wants and you happen to have a lot of money that turn, they allow for competition over a certain component or a certain upgrade or a certain contract. And when somebody completes those contracts or those upgrades, you tally up the scores. The scores are going to be on those contracts. And then you receive one point for each five money that you have. Plus you have the bonus points on your bonus point card that you can choose to use. Yeah. Each character has a little asymmetric ability that you're talking about, Andy, that they can either take an action during the game or they can score these bonus points at the end of the game. Be careful, though, if you play this game and you're looking at those asymmetric abilities, the character that Andy played, we weren't interpreting the power correctly at first, and it was way overpowered. And then we realized what we were doing. And we didn't, like, get into the game very far before we realized. In fact, it didn't really affect anything by the time we realized it. No, it didn't. But had we not realized it, it would have been a huge difference. Be careful. Some things are not worded great. Well, that happens in all games, right? Totally. I mean, and there's great options. BGG forums have a lot of explanation, which we use to try to clarify that card. I think it's a very quick, easy game. It takes a little bit to grasp at first, but once you get a handle on it, your second game is going to be a ton faster than your first game, even for you, Dave. Yeah. I thought it was great. Got an engine builder aspect to it, deck builder. It was quick. It's kind of odd because, like you said, extremely simple. During explanation in particular, it sounds crazy. And, and I was like, whoa. But then it, very quickly, you figure out what's going on, and it becomes a very, very simple game. Not necessarily simple to play well. I can do that with a lot of games. <laughs> <laughs> but that is Xenon Profiteer. It's released through Eagle Griffin Games. It's a two to five player game, plays in about 30 minutes, and designed by TC Petty. Very cool. All right, one game left to talk about. In the 2400s, mankind begins to terraform the planet Mars. Giant corporations sponsored by the world government on Earth initiate huge projects to raise the temperature, the oxygen level, and the ocean coverage until the environment is habitable. Yes, Logan, we're talking about terraforming Mars. Ugh. <laughs> Lucky you. Terraforming Mars, as many of you know, is a game that I love. And I love it because it's one of the best games to come out in the last 10 or more years. This is a game for 1 to 5 players. It takes no longer than 120 minutes to play. <laughs> wow. Who's 120 minutes? Can, oh. can you say that with a straight face? <laughs> says that it's a 120-minute playing time. Why? <laughs> Is that your record for best time? No. 
I've played, played it quicker than that. No, you yeah. haven't. There's yeah, have. no way. Was it solo? <laughs> it is published by Fricks Games, designed by Jacob Frixelius. This is a game, if you have not played, you definitely need to do it. In this game, as the description says, you're trying to terraform the planet Mars and make it habitable. And in order to do that, you have to place oceans on the surface, raise the oxygen, and you have to increase the heat. Once all of those things reach set level, the game is over. And you count points, winner has the most. There are a lot of different ways of scoring points in this game. You gain terraform rating every time you move the oxygen up or the heat up or place an ocean. A game that has tons of cards, it's all played with cards. The cards are different types of buildings, technologies, space structures, just a lot of different things that you can build and put into your tableau. Sometimes it'll give you money, sometimes they'll give you points, sometimes it will give you abilities and actions. There's a lot going on in this game. On your personal player mat, you have several resources that you can use throughout the game. There are credits, which is the money used in terraforming Mars. There's steel, which can be used to pay for certain types of buildings. There's titanium that can also be used to pay for certain types of buildings and certain events. You also have plants that you can use. Once you have enough plants, you can place a greenery tile on the surface of Mars. The greenery tile will increase oxygen. Energy that can be used to fuel different things. If it's not used, the next turn during the production step, that energy transfers and becomes heat, and heat can be used to raise the temperature. The card play in this game is really cool. Start each round, you're dealt four cards. At the beginning of each round, you're dealt some cards you are going to draft. Select one, pass the remaining cards to your neighbor. You keep drafting until you've gone through all of the cards. Then you determine how many cards you're going to keep. The cards cost you three credits a piece. You kind of have to balance how badly do I actually want this card? Is it enough that I want to pay all this money right now? Can I afford to hold on to it? For the length of time it takes to play this game, there are surprisingly few rounds. You have to balance that. This is going to increase my money production by three steps, but it's going to cost me this amount and I'm only going to have it for maybe seven rounds. Like I said before, there's a lot going on. You have a hand of cards that will use your resources to pay for, get them into play, use their abilities or their rewards to help fuel your efforts. There are several things on the board you can do um, as far as you can pay credits to fund awards um, and milestones and projects. Depending on which board you're using, there are certain awards that can be funded award points to a player who has, for example, the most energy at the end of the game. This is a game that is slow to build at first. But then because, it takes right off. Yeah, because everybody's trying to get an engine in place, and at some point, it just blasts off. It takes off and it runs away, and you're like, no, 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 not yet. And everybody's increasing the levels of everything multiple times on a turn, and, and then all of a sudden you run out of time to do anything. A lot of your cards have requirements to be played. Sometimes you have to have a certain amount of heat to play a card, or sometimes there is a maximum amount. Like I said, there's hundreds of cards in this game. It's got cool artwork. I like the theme. Terraforming Mars, if you have not played this game, find somebody who has it and play it, especially if they have the big box version. It's got some awesome components that just add the cool factor of the game. The big box upgrade is awesome. Several people had made some 3D printings of their own, but this includes 3D printings. You have biodomes for your cities. It really does upgrade the game and make it look amazing. Still doesn't make me want to play it with you, but I could probably play it with Andy and Logan and not have any issues with it. Tend to rag on this game a little bit. Probably not fair to do so. It really is a fun game. I think my biggest problem with it is there are individuals within our circles that play this a lot. Those tend to be the people that I've played with. You don't even stand a chance. Last time I played this, it was at SaltCon two years ago. I literally would walk away when my turn was over. I was playing two games at once. I think it was Thunderstone Quest. 
about a half hour or so, I'd come back and it still wasn't my turn. Everybody was still playing cards and the round hadn't ended. I was done. I had passed. It just took a long time because the other three players were extremely familiar with the game and I wasn't. They were extremely familiar with all the cards and what worked well together and how to extend their turns so that they had all the blue cards that give you extra actions. I didn't know any of the cards. I'd only played it one other time, and it was one of the worst gaming experiences I've ever had. That being said, the game itself is fun. It would be fun to play it, just with not Dave. (laughs) (laughs) Whatever, Andy Poops. No offense, Dave. I, no offense. I don't know how you can not take that offensively, but no offense. No offense. 120 minutes for Dave is a lot different than 120 minutes for me, so I understand. It's definitely one of those games that I have the exact same experience as you, Andy. If you play the game with people or they're not familiar or don't have the game memorized, it is a much different playing experience. Well, I played it with Ryan, Dennis, and David. And Dennis and Ryan, I think, have played it more than Dave has. Oh, yeah. But Dave has a knack of collecting cards in any game that has cards. For some reason, he manages... I don't know if he's just sitting too close to the deck like he does with the resources. <laughs> but he always has a million cards to play. Because that's just his style of play. Add that to Dennis and Ryan being so familiar with the game. It was just such a huge disadvantage for me. I agree, Nathan. It'd be fun to, with someone that's at least my level of understanding the game. And I've only played this game a few times. One of the times was an experience like Andy's, and one of the other times was Nathan and his daughter Ashley. It was a much more enjoyable game for me. So if you're going to play it, I would suggest Big Box version because it has really cool, awesome 3D terrain. Also, struggle and learn the game together so that way not one person is particularly advantaged over the other. Watch some videos if you need to do it that way. I think that is going to be the best way you can incorporate this into your game night. Because it is a solid game. One good way to do that is uh, get the app. You're absolutely right. Get the app. Well, to an extent. Because playing solo is very much different than playing the game with someone else. It is. But you do get a chance to learn a lot of the cards and a lot of interactions and different things like that. I will definitely give you that. That will do it. We will close the cash register drawer to these four economic games. Hopefully you have got a sampling of different style of games. Each of these games were very different. It is a great opportunity to spend some money on some quality economic games. Until next time. We'll see you cashing out at the game table. As always, we want to thank you for listening. Check out our website. We have all sorts of cool things there. Love those blogs. Get a deeper look into the writing side of Maple Nation. Join our Facebook group, Maple Nation Off Air. I look forward to seeing you there. Follow us on Twitter, at Meeple Nation. We also have Instagram. Under the same name. We also want to thank our sponsor, GameToppersLLC.com. We love their product, and they have so much goodness out there. And we also want to thank Braiding Detergent for our music.
We are discuss- discussing. Discussing? <laughs> we are discussing. That's all right, who's going to go first? That's you his. are first on the list. I know, but I feel like I'm always first on this, and then I take like 30 minutes. <laughs> you do. <laughs> Those are two unrelated things. <laughs> You don't have to take 30 minutes just because you're first on the Somebody list. Somebody else go first, and then I will I'll go look at the time, time, and I'll be like, okay, I only have five minutes. 